I really just don't get a lot of people's Ooh. love for him. I him think that. Words. Yeah, I know, right? I, I I feel like I'm definitely in the minority there. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Nerds You're Looking For podcast, a weekly nerd culture podcast that discusses nerdom through various segments. My name's Tyler Hunt, and I'm here with my co-host, as always, Pat Coon. How's it going, man? I'm good. We, uh, My wife and I went to Shocktober in Irvington uh, oh, Friday yeah. night, so a couple of days ago. We're recording this on Sunday, and it was a lot of fun, but I kind of I felt a little bad. Because I was not in a very good mood. Because when are you in a great mood, though? Yeah, I mean, I mean that that's a good point. I'm I'm usually in a pretty sour mood most of the time, but especially on Friday because I don't know why, but Indy and Evansville, like I sixty nine, they really need to get their shit together because it is. Yeah. I feel like it's not getting any better; that it's only getting worse. <laughs> because it's it's so bad. I mean, I know we hit it at kind of like rush hour traffic, so that was our fault. We probably should have left a little early, but it literally took us three and a half hours to get to Indy. And it, the, there's no way that that's longer than it used to be before I sixty nine was even built. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It was we were literally stopped for like ten minutes on the highway. It was ridiculous. It took us forty five minutes to get five miles at one point. It was huh. ridiculous, and it put such a weird vibe on the rest of the night that it just felt like it was almost kind of, like, wasted. Like, the, the show itself, the, the films were really, really good. We talked, obviously, a lot about us doing a short film uh, two years ago, and that kind Dude, of... that was last year. Oh, yeah, that was last year. For some reason, I thought it was two years ago. I don't know. I'm still waking up this morning, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, so it was last year, and that kind of – every time I see a short film or, or films in general, I, I, I find that I, I have a more of an appreciation for it because I, I've gone through it a little bit, and I kind of understand how hard it is to do all of that stuff, especially when they're actually moving the camera because we didn't <laughs> do that at all. We basically just sat it still and just let people talk. And so uh, we definitely had a lot of Kevin Smith <laughs> influence <laughs> as far as that was concerned. But I, I find that I, I have more of an appreciation for that because we did it. And so I really enjoyed the, the short films, don't get me wrong, but I was just in such a shitty mood because the way we do it is we go there, we drive up early, we get dinner, we watch the show, and then we drive back. So it's like we barely made it in time. Like we, we had to scarf down dinner and uh -huh. drive to the venue, and it was just – it was really just – I felt rushed the whole time, and then the whole time we were sitting there, I was like, man, in a couple hours, we're going to have to do that all over again, and so it just kind of put a weird vibe on the show, but other than that, like I said, the the short films were a lot of fun. It was in a different venue, a little bit smaller venue, so it felt more like a community, because with the Irvington Theater, it was, everybody kind of sat away from each other, and there was a lot yeah. more room, so it didn't feel like as much of a community because everybody was kind of spread out. So I thought that the venue change was a really good thing for the show because everybody was kind of scrunched in and it felt more like a community. And it seemed like every film kind of benefited from that because the reaction felt bigger because of that. So overall, the show was really fun and, and good. It just kind of was a weird vibe because I was pissed off. <laughs> I, I feel like that's the... That's the Pat Coon life story is it's a weird vibe because he's pissed off. Yeah, that should uh, be the, the <laughs> title of my autobiography. <laughs> no, I, I wish I could have gone to Shocktober. I've missed it more than I've made it at this point. I didn't even get to go whenever we showed our, our short film. But I've been thinking a lot about the short film lately just because we just got through like the, the period of the year that we filmed it in. And then, of course, now it's October. So it's uh, it's a... I wouldn't call it a horror movie, I guess, but you know, it's, it's a, a movie for this time of year. So I've been thinking about it a lot. And the more I think about it, it's really not that bad, man. Like, I think that it's, you wrote a really funny movie. And, uh, 
I was wondering, are we ever going to, to like put it out there or do you want to not do that because of some of the issues with like the first couple minutes of it? Yeah, I kind of want to fix that. There is a, I think I've talked about this before, but there's a Evansville annual film festival called the May Day Film Festival. I've actually been there before. It's really cool. And I would love to put that out there to that particular film festival, but I definitely want to f- fix that first scene. I had some trouble with editing and the audio, and the audio is like a millisecond off, and it irritates me every time I watch it. Huh. And so other than that, I, th- I mean, I think fondly of it, especially considering it was their first ever try. Like, we literally had no idea what we were doing. And we just kind of cut it together because we are huge film nerds and we just kind of, kind of know how to do it. So, uh, just from knowing that much about film. And so yeah. it was really fun. I just, I really enjoy it. And I thought it turned out pretty well considering the fact that we have no formal training whatsoever. Those first couple of minutes, that first scene really, I mean, it just kind of bugs me. So if I could fix that, if I yeah. had a little bit more time to fix that, I think, uh, it would be, I mean, it's definitely something that I'm proud of no matter what, but it's definitely something that I feel like would, at least from my perspective, I feel a lot better about. It's funny because I think the biggest fan of that movie is my mother-in-law. Uh, we showed it to her because obviously my wife, Brittany, uh, plays, I mean, arguably the biggest part in the movie. She's and, the, by uh, far the best in that movie. Yeah, and she's And she's actually, I mean... I think she missed her calling because she's not a bad actress for never having done it before. So, uh, we, obviously we showed it to my mother-in-law and she, she still fucking talks about it, man. Oh, really? She's, not seen it. she's like, Oh, you got to show this person that movie you were in. It, it's funny. Uh, but she thinks it's hilarious. So yeah, I was, I was so surprised because I mean, obviously we, we just did this on a, not necessarily a whim because we had it planned, but. We didn't do any auditions or anything like that. It was just like, who can we get to do these things? And your wife was not necessarily reluctant, but I mean, we kind of had to talk her into it a little bit. And once we started, like, she didn't memorize any of the lines. We were just kind of feeding it to her (laughs) before the scene and was like, basically, this is what's happening. Here's your line. Go. And she just immediately got almost every single scene like we did very rarely did we have to do another take with her it was usually me or you that we had to do <laughs> oh, the, yeah. the multiple takes for <laughs> i mean i'm just i'm absolute garbage at it like i just was so uncomfortable uh doing it it was it was bad so i i'm not an actor at all if i ever had any thoughts of becoming one that was uh quickly uh diminished after we did our short film but she was amazing i just, i still think about it i'm just like man she was really really good yeah she was man and i figure that the more we talk about it on the podcast the more hopefully pressure we'll get to put it out there because i think that it'd be funny to see what people think of it but who knows we'll get there one day for sure. So uh, to start off each episode, if this is your first episode, we kind of just like checking in with each other. We call it what we're into. So what are you into this week? So yesterday I had a free day up here in Cleveland. And as I, I've talked about kind of through my move up here, uh, I'm by myself currently. My wife is still down in Evansville. So had a day to do whatever I wanted to do. So of course that included seeing a movie and I went back and forth on what I was going to see because there's a few things out right now I'm interested in. Uh, Battle of the Sexes is showing up here as well as uh, The Mountain Between Us. I kind of want to see American Made because it's gotten some good reviews. And uh, so I was picking between those three movies and I ended up going to see Battle of the Sexes and I- I'm glad I did. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed though because I do want to see uh, The Mountain Between Us, but it's gotten some poor reviews. So uh, anyways... Long story short, I'm going to talk about Battle of the Sexes. If you are not familiar with this movie, it's a biopic about Billie Jean King and the famous tennis match she had with Bobby Riggs in the 70s that was called Battle of the Sexes, which is where that title comes from. At least that's what the trailers led on that it's about. So this movie is not so much about that tennis match as it is a biopic about Billie Jean King and her struggle with her sexuality while being married to a man, with the Battle of the Sexes tennis match just kind of being background noise and the climax of the movie. So there's nothing wrong with that, and and it's still a good biopic, but it makes me wonder why it was marketed the way it was. So it was definitely an interesting story that I I didn't know. I, I didn't know who Billie Jean King was, to be completely honest with you, before this movie was coming out, just because it took place 
way before my time. And I guess that I'm ignorant to the news because she was given like the Medal of Honor by President Obama a few years ago. And I, I like I said, I was ignorant to that. But um, basically, this movie starts out with a group of women tennis players that, you know, are set out for equality and equal prize money as their male co- counterparts and for their matches. So they start their own. I don't know what it's called. I guess a tennis league. Uh, but in doing so, they're excommunicated from the National Tennis League, which is not what it's called, but is what I'm going to pretend it's called because I don't remember, uh, which is honestly, it's some pretty heroic stuff because it takes some balls to to walk away from that and, and start your own thing. So um, in addition to focusing on that and Billy King, it also focuses on Bobby Riggs' life. Um, Bobby Riggs is, of course, played by Steve Carell in this movie, and he's not necessarily portrayed as a bad person in the film. He's just a vibrant character and a hustler, and he knows how to put on a show. And from the movie, I don't know that he was actually a chauvinist in his personal life, but he was very convincing either way. So um, in addition to to Steve Carell playing Bobby Riggs, I I did forget to mention that Emma Stone plays Billie Jean King. And I think that they were both pretty fantastic in this movie. And Sarah Silverman also is in this movie as Billie Jean King's manager, and I think that she does a really great job too. She's definitely got some acting chops that we've seen her flex before, but this is probably one of her better roles. Uh, the thing that threw me off while I was watching this movie, though, is Billie Jean King was married to uh, a man named Larry King. And the whole time I was watching that, I'm like, is this the Larry King that we all know from, like, his talk show? And it was confu- I was confused because it's played by, like, this tall, handsome, blonde guy. And I'm like, there's no way that that's the Larry King I know. And, and it turns out it's not. It's this tennis player named Larry King from back then. But, like, the, half the movie, I was just really dumbfounded that she was married to Larry King, the, the late night host. But um, for me, uh, I, you and I were kind of talking about this whenever, uh, bef- before we started recording. Uh, one of the coolest parts of going to this movie was um, the movie going experience. And I was in the, the theater with a bunch of older people that I think, uh, they think that it's okay to, I guess, just have full on conversations while you watch a movie. And while it was annoying for the most part, at the end of the movie where you actually see the tennis match between Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King, there were women in the audience that were getting animated each time Billie Jean won a point. And even though that would typically irritate me, I thought it was pretty cool, uh, kind of being there in the moment for that. So in the end, uh, I think that there's a reason that this movie wasn't released during Oscar time. Because I don't think that it's going to be necessarily nominated for anything like Best Picture. But I wouldn't be surprised to see some type of nomination come around for someone here like Emma Stone or Steve Carell. Because it was a very well acted movie and it was a pretty cool biopic. Yeah, this is a movie that I'm somewhat interested in. I will probably end up going to see it. Because, I mean, of course I respect your opinion and you gave it a favorable review but also because my wife really wants to see it and she sees a lot of stuff that uh, she doesn't necessarily want to see because I want to see it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, not Blade Runner 2049, though. She would not go see that with me, (laughs) but uh, she does go see a lot of stuff with me, so I'll probably end up seeing it. It does somewhat intrigue me that they didn't really market it uh, as well, and I wonder if that's on purpose because... Of the sexuality thing, I don't yeah. know if they could necessarily market that and and do really well. Unfortunately, yeah, I mean, I mean you, that that's kind of sad to think of it that it. way. But you I'm see sorry, bits go and ahead. pieces of it. No, you see bits and pieces of it in the trailer. Like you, it's uh, let on that she's a lesbian, but it's it's definitely more about that than what the the promotional material shows. So uh, I would recommend taking your wife to see it because I got in trouble for going to see it without my wife because not only is she, was she interested in seeing this movie, but she used to play tennis and loves tennis. So I'm in some deep shit for not going with her. So definitely take Chrissy with you. Yeah. So I feel like if there was ever a movie about hurdling, I would be really in trouble because well, apparently my <laughs> wife did hurdles. <laughs> but yeah, that that's on you because yeah, for sure. you I'll know your that. wife used to play tennis. So yeah, I'll take I'll take it. That's fine. So I, do I don't know man? that much about oh, Brittany. Right. Actually, I know she's a good actress. And I know that she <laughs> plays tennis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. What are you into? So I am into a show that I believe you talked about when it was first released, Horace and Pete's. Mm-hmm. The first season is on Hulu. I guess the first season or the series. I don't know if they're going to continue making the show or not. And when you talked about it, you mentioned that it wasn't that funny. 
which right. was surprising because it's Louis C.K. It's written and directed by Louis C.K., which is the best uh, stand-up working right now. I watched the first couple episodes on Hulu, and I would agree with that. It is not funny, but in his defense, it's not really what it's he's going for with this show. Oh, for sure. And if I remember correctly, it's been a little bit since you've talked about it, but I feel like you were lukewarm on it. Is that right? Yeah, I, I only watched the pilot. Okay. Yes, I was lukewarm on the pilot. And I would agree with that assessment as well, because I was uh, very lukewarm on this show. Um, as good as a comedy writer as he is, which obviously he's one of the best stand-ups, like I said, and he also has one of the funniest shows on TV right now, even though it's taken this really long hiatus in Louis. Yeah. So as good of a comedy writer as he is, I just don't think that he writes drama that well. And that's what this show is. It's a drama. It's a family drama. The family drama aspect of this show works fairly well. I mean, it's not the best I've ever seen it, but I think it works pretty well as as well as this show is. Um, there's just too much around it. They do some stuff with mental illness, which isn't horrible. Like they, they don't they don't tackle the issue as well as I think they could have, but it's not egregious what they do with it. Uh, it's just not as effective as the family drama stuff is. But w- what really gets me about this show and what's kind of unforgivable as far as I'm concerned is the bar patrons in this show. Yeah, I think most shows within this kind of genre, like Cheers and, and others, they kind of use the bar patrons as kind of comic relief. And I I think he tries to get away from that, which is fine. I I like when shows kind of try to buck the the cliche of the genre, but he kind of uses them to talk about other points that don't really have anything to do with what's going on in the the actual show. And they feel to me kind of like they're rejected stand-up routines. Like he wanted to say something about this topic. He didn't really know how. He didn't really find a way to write it so it's funny, so he can't use it in stand-up. So he just lets these people say these really weird monologues that don't feel natural. Like, people don't talk the way that people talk in this show. Like, the bar patrons, like, talk in a way that... I've never been in a bar where I've talked to somebody and they've said elegant stuff like this. Like, people don't actually talk the way that he writes these people to talk. It just doesn't feel natural. There's literally a scene in this show where there is a kind of stereotypical liberal hippie, and then there's the the really well-dressed liberal stereotype, and they're literally having a debate where this, like, homeless guy is moderating at the bar. And I'm like, nobody talks like that. There's no way that these two people are not going to like rip, e- rip each other's head off in this bar. Cause they're probably both pretty drunk at this point. And there's no way that they're going to be this elegant and articulate, uh, at this bar. Like nobody talks like that. And every time one of them go- kind of goes on one of their rants, I just kind of roll my eyes and I'm just like, okay, I kind of just check out because I don't care about what they're saying and it doesn't feed into the show at all. So it just feels like a distraction and it really kind of takes me out of the show because like I said, the family drama stuff is done pretty well, but just the rest of it is just really poorly written and I just don't like it at all. My wife and I watch it this together and she only got through two episodes. I gave it one more episode and I was like, "Ah, I'm done. I watched enough. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely... I mean, obviously, from whenever I, I spoke about it and talked about the pilot, that's the definitely the vibe I got. And I I thought about giving the next few episodes a shot, so I'm glad I didn't. Is what I definitely got out of that. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna revisit this show. I I definitely appreciate Louis C.K. as a comedian, but this one was a swing and a miss for me. I do respect that he's doing stuff like this and trying to be innovative, but. That doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be something I want to watch. Yeah, for sure. And it certainly doesn't help that he is a really bad actor. And I don't, (laughs) it's so funny because, I mean, he's the star of Louie, one of my favorite TV shows. And I think it's because it's so well written and it's so clever that I kind of get lost in it and I don't realize how bad of an actor he is. Because he had a show called Lucky Louie on HBO a long time ago. And I, at the time, I was, already a fan of his as a stand-up so i watched it 
And I remember thinking the show wasn't that good and he was a really bad actor and then it got canceled and then they had Louie come along a few le- years later and I just really got into it and it's so much better written than Lucky Louie and so you kind of forget that he is a bad actor but it is really apparent in this show how bad of an actor he really is because I'm not into the show at all and so I noticed that how <laughs> just just excruciatingly bad he is have a uh, so I mean I won't get into the details and stuff but have you heard the allegations against him that like Tign- Tignataro has brought up. Yeah, I heard about it a few years ago. I think it was on a podcast. What's her name? Uh, Jen Kirkman talked oh, about yeah. it on a yep. podcast, and yeah. she didn't name him by name, but it was pretty evident that that's who she was talking about. And it's weird for me because, I mean, obviously I've talked about this before. I do stand up, and he's definitely a guy that I've looked up to, and it feels weird. It feels dirty to me. I mean, it's yeah. their allegations, their rumors. So, you, I mean, you, you take it with a grain of salt, but it's the same thing with Cosby. Like enough people say the same story, it becomes less likely that he didn't do it. So yeah, it just so- it makes me feel dirty because I've looked up to him for so long. I mean, you could still appreciate his comedy and you could still look at, up to him as a comedian, but as a person, he sounds kind of like a garbage person. Yeah, I've I I just kind of fell down a rabbit hole of reading all that stuff within the last month or two. And I definitely had a bad taste in my mouth regarding him recently. So just promise me, Pat, that if you ever make it big with stand up, you don't get your jollies by jerking off in front of girls. I assumed that that was a plus of getting famous. (laughs) (laughs) Like that was one thing I was really looking forward to. (laughs) No, Uh, of course I'm kidding. I, I can't stress that enough, but (laughs) yeah, yeah. It's, it just makes me feel really, really dirty about the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. So since it makes us feel so dirty, let's move on to comics. Yes. Uh, what did you read this week? So typically, behind the scenes, you and I like just text each other back and forth. What comic are you going to talk about this week to make sure that we don't double up on the same comic? We didn't do that this week, so I'm slightly nervous that we're going to talk about the same comic. But, not Punisher, uh, not Punisher, not Punisher. The comic, the only comic I read this week was Punisher Platoon number oh, one. Oh, you're killing me! <laughs> so, Pat, while I discuss Punisher Platoon, uh, you can decide what what we're gonna do here. So, <laughs> I guess we're just um, talking about Punisher Bull- yeah, the Platoon. Yeah, no, that works. That that works because uh, I have stuff to say about it, and I'm sure you do too. So, essentially, this is a Punisher prequel. That is done by the team that did the Max series, which is the dark, gritty, gory, and highly regarded um, best Punisher stories that ever done. It's, so the Max series is like the label of Marvel where they can get away with cursing and blowing people's heads off and that kind of stuff. And the Max Punisher series is very highly regarded. So Garth Ennis is the writer here. And in addition to his nine-year run with the Punisher on the Punisher Max series, he's also best known as co-creating Preacher which, of course, is a very successful AMC show right now. So um, this book is basically, it's a a mix of an adult theme with an amazing writer. So you'd think that going into it, it was going to be uh, a great miniseries. But the problem I had with this book is that I don't think anybody necessarily ever asked for a Punisher prequel. At least I didn't. I don't really care about his time before being the Punisher. It reminds me of the TV show Gotham. Gotham is a Batman story with nothing Batman, so nothing that we necessarily love about the character and and his uh, enemies. So this book, again, is the Punisher before Frank Castle is the Punisher. It follows him in the Vietnam War. Uh, The first issue is fairly simple. The narrator is an unseen writer that's trying to write the definitive account of Frank Castle's time in Vietnam, and he's talking to members of the platoon. And then we flash back to Vietnam and and see Frank Castle in the war. I will say that uh, I do seem to be in the minority for people who dislike this book. We'll find out what Pat thinks here in a second. Uh, But most of the reviews for this book have been pretty positive. Ennis is obviously a, a great writer. He has a great track record. And his Max series is on my list of things to read and has been highly recommended to me by my stepbrother-in-law, but again, the problem I had with this book is the entire time I read it, I just kept thinking, who cares? 
to me, Frank Castle's time in the army has always been a framing device to explain why he's good at killing and why he's good at using various weapons. But I've never once asked what was his time in Vietnam like. But again, I suppose I'm in the minority. So this miniseries won't be for me, but I will admit that it's cool that Garth Ennis came back to this character. With that being said, I am pretty eager to hear what you thought of it. So I disagree with you. I, I, I do think that the character is interesting enough that he can kind of carry this miniseries. I am kind of intrigued by the prequel aspect of it. I would like to see kind of his early days before he was the Punisher, because I think that kind of shapes him as a character. And so I'm definitely interested in it. And I think that Garth Ennis is obviously a really talented writer who's written the character really well for a long time. But I feel very similar to the way I felt about Mother when we reviewed that. And now I didn't hate this book (laughs) close to as much as I hated that movie. But I feel like because it's somebody that everybody loves as far as a creator, in this case, uh, Garth Ennis, I feel like people are giving him a longer leash than we would anybody else. Like this book, being a number one, I've talked a lot in the past about how I feel number one should do in order to be successful. Like, you have to do a lot in a number one. You have to intrigue people uh, to continue reading, but you, so you have to give them a little bit to keep them interested in the miniseries or the series in general. But you want to don't want to blow your load. You don't want to be too exposition heavy. And I, I think that this book is, I mean, it's basically all exposition. And I feel like people are forgetting that because it's Garth Ennis, and they're like, oh, well, He's such a talented guy, so we're going to give him a little bit longer leash. And I do think that this there's some stuff in here that's good. I do like the Viet Cong are prominent. I do think that they're setting up a really good antagonist. So I do appreciate that. But at the same time, I feel like if this was anybody else, we'd be like, ah, oh, this is a, a mediocre book at best. I'm definitely intrigued by the story because it's him. I know I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but... Because it's him, I will continue reading it because I do think that there's enough there that and it's only a six part mini series, so I, I'm definitely intrigued to see where it's gonna go. But uh I definitely disagree with you. I, I do think that there's an interesting story here and I do appreciate that he's telling it. I just don't think that the first issue is as good as everybody else is saying it is. Well, do me a favor and stick with this six issue mini series, because I am not Okay. And let me know, let me know if I'm wrong or not. But okay. I just, I would rather go back and read the Max series where the Punisher is the Punisher. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, there's just other things that I'd rather read than Frank Castle not being the Punisher right now. I, I, uh, I want to get your thoughts because there was a line in there that made me roll my eyes a little bit. Cause he says something to the effect like, I'm not one of those guys that always follows the rules or something like that. (laughs) And I was like, oh, my God, like, please, no. Like, don't make this book just, like, tongue-in-cheek. Like, we we get it. He becomes the Punisher. Like, we understand that. Don't do that. Like, you're better than that. And I just – it really bugged me. How would you feel about that line, or did you even remember it? I didn't even remember it, but – I'm not surprised that it was in there because that was like the total vibe I got of this entire comic. Like I said, it it reminded me so much of Gotham, which yeah. is a show that I really hate. And uh, yeah, so that's definitely my feeling towards it. I honestly didn't text you about the comic because I figured that you were going to read uh, – what's that? What's the new Batman called? Uh, the White Knight oh, or yeah. whatever? I assumed yeah. I saw it, and I was like, oh, well, I could read that. And I was like, no, Tyler, do it. And then so I, I kind of yeah. moved on. I was like, ooh, a new Punisher book. And so I got excited I, about that. I do want to read it. The, so just a little bit of behind the scenes of my comic time while I'm away from everything that I pretty much own is that uh, I, I brought a, a giant stack of comics with me up to Cleveland that I, I wanted to read. And I went to a comic book store yesterday that I've never been to because obviously I'm new to the area and it was pretty shitty. Okay. They carry <laughs> new, they carry new books, but apparently they're like entirely sold out of almost everything by the time the weekend hits. Cause so I guess they don't order a ton of new books because they don't want to be like, you know, com- some of the comic stores we're familiar with down in Evansville where they sit on a lot of inventory. So I wasn't able to get like half of the stuff that was on my backed up list that I needed. So I ended up buying them off of Midtown, but. Like, my comics are all out of order right now, and I don't know, 
like I'm missing certain issues here and there. So it was easier for me just to, to read a number one. Which I guess could have also been the same thing with the Dark Knight Metal book uh, about the Batman character. I forget which one it's called this week. You said like the Guardian or whatever. But uh, yeah, I, I decided to go to the Punisher route because it was a straight up number one. Cool. So next time I think that I'm safe to not text you about it, I should probably text you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. So All what right, do you man. have for nerd news this week? So nerd news. So there were some leaks about the the story of the Gambit movie that's been long in gestation, uh, starring Channing Tatum. Uh, first off, uh, we were not going to get into all those story points, but the big thing that came out of it was that the villain in the movie is going to be Mr. Sinister. And there is some casting rumors uh, surrounding that character, and the, the rumor is that they're going after Daniel Craig to be Mr. Sinister, which I think is kind of crazy casting, but I'm not ne- I'm not necessarily opposed to it. No, I, I thought it was, uh, when I read that story, I thought it was uh, pretty interesting. Honestly, my thoughts about this movie is that they're ne- it's never going to get made. It's one of those yeah. movies that just seems like it's going to be in production hell forever. I won't be convinced that it's being made until I'm like sitting in the theater watching the movie. Because I this just, is a movie that they've talked about for so long and they just can't get it off the ground, which is surprising considering they have a star attached to it. I just, I don't... Th- I like the Gambit character a ton. Uh, I really do, but I don't know that he needs his own movie. Why don't, why are they so resistant to introducing him in one of the X-Men movies? Like he's a big enough character that putting him on that team would make a big deal. So. Well, you're forgetting have, that they did introduce him and it was a yeah, garbage and, movie and a garbage that, performance. I, yeah. Again, that's not introducing him as an X-Men though. That's introducing him as a side piece in a bad Wolverine movie. So I just, with them kind of re soft rebooting everything with the the next dark phoenix movie i don't see why you can't bring him in there and tell Channing tatum to kick bricks but whatever well, i mean it could still be him <laughs> he doesn't he necessarily have to do be that. his own movie he would be three times the age of all the other x-men yeah that's he'd true. be older That'd than be professor x <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't know actually i don't know how old he is but i feel like james mcavoy is about the same age yeah. Which, so, I mean, I still know. doesn't really work. <laughs> it do, yeah, it doesn't work out. But uh, in addition to that, it looks like Gore Verbinski might be directing it, who is also uh, very well known for the Pirates of the Caribbean movies that he did when that franchise was first getting off yeah. its feet. So, um, Or on its feet, I guess, would be the uh, expression there. But yeah, uh, he might direct it. So we'll see. We'll see if this movie ever comes out. Yeah, I'm not holding my breath for it. Speaking of movies that will probably never come out, uh, The Mummy killed the dark universe i think over at universal so of course whenever the mummy was coming out they did like that photo shoot with the stars of the mummy and then johnny depp was in there because he's attached to play the invisible man and javier bardem was in there because he's going to play frankenstein's monster and then the one of the movies that they had in development was bride of frankenstein with bill uh, condon directing it the guy who did beauty and the beast this year and that movie is has been put on the back burner. They've kind of uh, halted its development, and it's pretty much just because the mummy killed everything that they were possibly working towards with that. Yeah, I mean that's not surprising at all because we kind of said that I think leading up to it, and when we reviewed the mummy, we we're like, "There's no way that they're going to continue with this because this movie is such garbage that they're they can't launch a, a movie universe from this garbage." Yeah, apparently. Like, they still want Angelina Jolie for it, but if they can't get her, they're going to go after Gal Gadot, which I hope she wouldn't do it either. So, I don't know. This I don't I don't think this movie is ever going to get made. No, for sure. It's it's not. Uh, I, I imagine that they're going to scrap it altogether, the whole universe, start over in about 10 years. That's probably what's going to happen. Yeah. I think the reason they waited was they were like, well, maybe the mummy would do really good on like home video and on demand and everything. And it's been out probably for what, like a month now. And I, it must not be doing well because obviously it's a shit movie. So yeah, that's where we're at with the dark universe. Let's see. Then a a couple trailers here. Did you see the, uh, the Pacific Rim trailer? I did. I saw it when, when I went and saw Blade Runner. Yeah. That's when I saw it as well. What'd you think of it? It looks pretty cheesy. <laughs> yeah, it I, does, uh, right? 
one of the redeeming qualities of the first one, and I really, really, really wanted to like that movie a lot. I, I remember leading up to it, I was like, oh man, wait for Pacific Rim, that looks awesome, and then it came and I was very, very disappointed. But one of the redeeming qualities of that movie is uh, Charlie Day's character. And maybe it was just a trailer, but his one-liners or or just kind of catchphrases in that trailer looked super, super cheesy. Yeah, they they do. To me, like the first one kind of looked like a Transformers movie, but it had enough to stand on its own apart from that franchise. This movie straight up looks like a Transformers movie. And obviously, we've both let our opinions be known on, on that franchise. So to me, I just, I think I've lost interest in giant robots fighting and obviously this movie does hint at there being monsters and that still being there but it just doesn't look great to me yeah it's funny that you bring up transformers because i know that they're working on like a bumblebee side project thing or spinoff and when that trailer started you kind of see this little girl and then there's like this machine walking and i was like is this a Bumblebee trailer? Like, <laughs> I didn't think they were even starting filming this yet. And then, of yeah. course, it went Pacific Pacific Rim 2. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, th- that makes more sense. But my immediately, my brain went to Transformers. Yeah, for I mean, for good reason. We haven't talked about the Bumblebee movie in Nerd News because I think it's a movie that neither of us are interested in and that we most likely won't review on the podcast. But uh, that movie is apparently, it takes place in the 80s. It stars Haley Steinfeld and uh, John Cena, and it just it sounds like a winner. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a winner, man. So, oh yeah, for let's sure. See. Uh, let's see. And then uh, there was a new Justice League trailer released this morning. I'm going to take a guess that you did not watch that. No, I I probably won't. I mean, I, I it will be hard for me to ignore it because I go to see so many movies. But so eventually I will see it. But I did not well, watch. I mean, it we're this like morning. we're like a month out from that movie releasing, so I don't know if it'll get in front of many movies before then or not. But uh, it's pretty much more of the same. Like I'm I'm still excited for this movie, and I'm definitely excited to see the imprint that Joss Whedon leaves on it. But uh, I was really nervous because the movie starts out with Amy Adams seeing Clark Kent out in a cornfield and like, there's like a, some dialogue between them and it turns out it's just a dream. Uh, but I was like, Oh my God, they're going to fucking do Batman be Superman. And they're going to like ruin doomsday in this movie by showing Superman in his black suit or something along those lines. Um, but luckily they did not. So hopefully they've learned from the mistakes they made in marketing with uh Batman be Superman giving away everything. But, uh, the other piece of trailer news is Star Wars. There's a new Star Wars trailer that's going to debut tomorrow during the Monday night football game uh, halftime. And then as soon as that trailer debuts, tickets go on sale for The Last Jedi. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm looking forward to that uh, game. For those that don't know, I'm a Chicago Bears fan, and they're going to be playing Monday night. So I'll be watching that game no matter what. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely excited that unfortunately might be the most exciting thing that's going to happen for me during that game because the bears aren't very good this year but uh yeah i'm definitely looking forward to it awesome man so that's all i have for nerd news all right so like i I mentioned kind of teased a little bit before we we both have seen uh blade runner uh 2049 and we're going to be reviewing it on this episode uh this movie the sequel to the original is uh directed by denny villeneuve who did uh Arrival and Prisoners, both movies are very, very good. It stars Ryan Gosling as Officer K, as who is a Blade Runner who discovers a long-buried secret that leads him to hunt down Deckard, which, of course, is uh, played in the original and in this film by Harrison Ford. Both of us have seen the original film. Tyler, I think, mentioned it for what he was into an episode, like, it seemed like, like a year or two ago. It was a while back, and I actually just watched it in anticipation for this movie coming out, like, a couple of weeks ago. It was definitely a nerd gap for me. I finally got to cross it off my list. And I would say, just real quick, I'm not obviously going to give a full-on review of Blade Runner that's been out for 30 years, but, uh... I think I appreciated it more as a film nerd, knowing that it kind of moved the sci-fi genre ahead as much as it did. I'm sure there's countless films that are 
influenced by this film, but I just, as a movie, I just didn't attach myself to it as much as other people have. I'm glad that I watched it, and it's definitely a movie that I may, may or may not watch in the future, especially when this, uh, the sequel comes out on Blu-ray. I'll definitely be owning it. And so I, I kind of look forward to kind of watching them back to back. So it's not a movie that I'm never going to watch again, but it's not a movie that I nece- necessarily as a fi- sci-fi fan attach myself to. Yeah, I, f- I feel the same way about it. And I don't know, with with the original Blade Runner, and again, like you said, this isn't a review of that movie necessarily, but for me, whenever you think of a science fiction film directed by Ridley Scott starring Harrison Ford, you think of it as something that's going to be a mix between Alien and Star Wars, and that was probably the the wrong mindset going into watching that movie. So while I also appreciated it, I found it kind of boring, to be honest with you. Yeah, it definitely has its moments, and I'm going to get into it a little bit when we talk about the sequel. It does meander a little bit, and that was kind of disappointing. It's really... I don't feel like it's much of a sci-fi movie. It's much more of a detective story, which I was surprised about. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's just jump right into our Blade Runner 2049 review. If this is your first episode, we start off each review just kind of just giving a general overview. We call it broad strokes. So how would you feel about Blade Runner 2049? So I was I was pretty excited for this movie in the sense that I was excited to see this franchise revisited and of course them bringing Harrison Ford back, but also having baby goose in there attached to star as well. Uh, definitely excited. Uh, mix that with Dennis Villeneuve. <laughs> you, you pronounce, you pronounced his name earlier and I was like, there's no way that Pat pronounced it right, but there's no way I'm going to pronounce it any better. It, it, I, I actually looked it up. It's Villeneuve. Like that. He's French Canadian and I looked it up. That is how you pronounce it. You're full of shit. It's Denny right. Villeneuve because he's French Canadian, so you he's don't not... pronounce the S in his in his first name. So it's Denny Villeneuve. All right. Well, French Canadians are fucking dumb. Then that's the <laughs> dumbest shit I've ever heard. So Denny Villeneuve directing. So I was pumped, even though, like I mentioned, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the first movie. Uh, again, I, I won't get into why I'm not a fan of the first movie, but. I had watched it in high school and didn't really remember anything from it and then rewatched it over the summer and prep here. But um, even with not enjoying that movie so much, I was still excited for Blade Runner 2049. And overall, I think they did a, a great job of carrying on the legacy of Blade Runner. And it definitely feels like it belongs in this universe. The only problem that I come up with is that I don't really care for this universe. So I definitely had mixed feelings when the movie was over. And I've been processing it pretty much for the last day, kind of ov- overall how I felt about it. Yeah, I, I think I I feel pretty similar going in that you did. Like, I, I wasn't really crazy about the first one, even though I, I, I do appreciate it as a film nerd. I wasn't crazy about it. Like I said, I never really attached myself to it. And so I was a little bit nervous because, like I said, um, it, that story kind of meanders a little bit. There's definitely a lot of dry moments in that film. And this movie, going in, I noticed that the runtime was so long. Like, it's two hours and 44 <laughs> minutes long. That's ridiculous. And so I, I was really nervous kind of going in that because the first film meanders a lot, I thought that this story would kind of do the same. And I was really surprised and I think we're going to disagree here that I never really felt the runtime. Like I thought it was actually a pretty tight story for almost three hours long. Um, I really, really like his dark and gloomy style. And so with the, the really tight story and well-developed characters, I was kind of all in with the story in this movie. Awesome, man. So you ready to get into story? Yeah. So we break up each review. And we just got done with Broad Strokes, so we're going to dive right into the story. How do you feel about the story of uh, Blade Runner 2049? So I know that it's it's blasphemy, blasphemy for a, a nerd to, to not like Blade Runner very much, but when you tell me a film is about a future cop called a Blade Runner that huts down and kills replicants, which are androids that look like humans, you think you're going to get one thing, but you get something that's very character-driven. And that's no fault of the movie. It's it's I completely put that on me, but... Um, in that original movie, I just didn't feel anything about the characters, to be honest. And this movie definitely rectifies that for me. I 
do care about the characters in this film and I'm genuinely interested in where the narrative is headed as I'm watching it. So we'll get into a lot of that in performances as well, because I think the performances were a big part of that. But I think that this movie does a great job expanding the world and making it feel grander than the first movie. Um, the one thing that I'm going to say that I disliked is where we're going to disagree is this w- movie is just way too fucking long. It's unnecessarily long. It didn't keep my attention in parts of it, and I was definitely checking the time in the last hour. I could tell that part of its length was definitely because this movie is a labor of love, and it wasn't something that was done for a paycheck. I think that Denny Ville, whatever, uh, <laughs> uh, definitely likes this this franchise and uh, wanted to make something he was passionate about, and I could feel it when watching this movie, and it definitely made me more passionate about it as well, but... I found myself on deciding on things that could have been cut as I was watching it, which is not a good sign. So while I think that this story is far and beyond better than the story that was told in the original Blade Runner, and it actually kept my interest and uh, made me passionate about the characters I was watching on screen, at the end of the day, it was just a little too bloated for my my, my taste. So what do you think could have been cut, though? Because, I, I mean, I, I thought about it. Like, I sat down, and I was like, I was surprised at how into it I was. And I was thinking about the story bits, and I couldn't find one that could get cut. The only thing that I could think that maybe was a little fat, and I'm going to talk about it in my story, so I don't want to get too much into it. I'm just curious to to see uh, what you thought. Like, what so, could I mean, I'd, cut? I'd ha- I wish I could have taken notes as I watched it, but I was in a pretty packed theater, and obviously that would have been annoying. Uh, so I'd need to watch it again to remember which parts. Uh, a lot of stuff with uh, his jerk-off instruction girlfriend, uh, Joy, uh, I think could have been cut. And a- again, I'd have to watch it again to, to kind of trim the rest of it. There weren't necessarily many full scenes I thought could, that could be gotten rid of, but you could have definitely trimmed this movie down by, I think, a half hour uh, with some of the exposition. Yeah, I actually thought that that's what you where you were going with him and his girlfriend i actually liked that and it's gonna kind of i'm gonna jump ahead in my my notes here with the story but um because it felt like it was almost like a callback with uh harrison ford's character and rachel in in the first movie like i felt like that relationship was very similar to that in the first film so i didn't mind it so much but yeah if there's any fat in this movie it's that relationship but like i said i liked the fact that it was kind of like a callback to the first movie she's the driving force of this particular character in the movie and so i really appreciate that but yes that was the kind of the first thing that came to my mind when i was sitting down and thinking about the story and like man this is almost a three-hour movie could we have cut anything and that was the first thing that popped into my head but then the more i thought about it like i said um i thought that it was kind of a cool little callback to the the original movie so cool in the first film and i i know that we've been kind of harping on the first film a lot but it's kind of tough not to talk about it uh when you have a sequel in the first film harrison ford's character deckard is basically just hunting the replicants because they're illegal and that's that and in this movie i felt like the story was more important like, I, I felt the sense of danger if this secret was revealed. And in the first film, one of the reasons I think I didn't necessarily attach myself to it was it's a cool story. It's a cool idea. But I just didn't ever feel danger. Like, what would happen if Harrison Ford didn't catch these replicants? Oh, they would just die in a couple of years. Cool. Yeah, they might go crazy and kill people. And obviously that's important. But... In the whole scope of this universe, would it really matter? And I don't think it would. And in this story, I think it definitely would have mattered if this secret was revealed. I think it would definitely have thrown this little order that they have in this universe into chaos. And so I definitely appreciated that, that this story felt more important. I liked that, um, and again, we're going to disagree with this, that it doesn't meander that much. Like I, like I said, I don't think there's a ton of fat. I really liked that with the secret that they didn't spend too much time explaining or really any time explaining 
how it's possible that it happened. Like, I, I talked a lot uh, with my comic book segment uh, last episode, I think it was, where I talked about comic book science, where that comic book spent a ton of time explaining how everything works, and we know it doesn't work, so why even waste the time? And in this m- movie, they don't waste that much time, even though it does. Ha- they have plenty of time, because it's a three-hour movie, essentially. Uh, they don't waste a ton of time, which I really appreciated. I will say... Kind of my one big negative uh, with this film, and especially with the story, is the misdirection with the secret. <laughs> they they kind of lay it on pretty thick at, early in the movie. And being a big time movie goer, with it being a three hour movie, I knew that that wasn't gonna be the case. Like I would have been really disappointed if they had revealed this secret at the beginning. I mean, it was within like thirty minutes of this movie. So it's the thir- first act is really not even over in this movie, and they've already kind of revealed, laid it on pretty thick, what the secret is. And if it had been that, if it had gone the entire movie and been that thing, and obviously I'm trying to be super vague to not give any spoilers away, as we always do with these reviews, I would have been super, super disappointed because they laid it on so thick, and they basically tell you that in about an hour and a half into this movie. So essentially halfway through this movie, they tell you who they think the secret is or the secret identity is. And I would have been really, really disappointed if that had been the case. I will give it a little bit of redemption because even though it's a misleading or misdirection at the beginning of the movie, it kind of is a misdirection in the movie at the end. Like that's why that person was kind of led to believe this thing was that they wanted whoever came up with this and i know it's it's kind of hard to talk about it uh, being super vague but uh it was meant to be a misdirection in the movie so i did appreciate that but uh i did kind of find myself rolling my eyes a little bit in the beginning of the movie every time they kind of laid it on pretty thick it was a uh, kind of this uh i don't want to say dissatisfying because it again it ended up kind of rectifying itself towards the end, but that's the one negative thing about this movie that I could really think of, especially with the story. And my next note is obviously because of the, is the love story that I've already kind of get into. So that's pretty much it. I, <laughs> all I have for the story. Okay, cool. So performances. Yeah, go ahead. So I thought the performances in this movie were pretty great. I think baby goose, uh, continues to impress. And then, um, uh, Harrison Ford showed up the best he could the, in the most Harrison Ford way that we've seen over the last 10 years. Um, I also, I have a soft spot for Ana de Armas, who plays his jerk off instruction girlfriend, Joy, uh, which it is It makes me very of. uncomfortable that you call her that. I don't, I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> if, <laughs> dude, that, don't spell Joy that way and don't expect me to think of it as jerk off instruction. Uh, that's just what's going to happen. So, uh, no, I have a soft spot for her because uh, I remember seeing her in Knock Knock uh, a couple shock Octobers ago and really thinking that she was great as a psychopath in that movie. And it was cool to see her in this movie shine. I thought that she was really great as his artificial intelligence girlfriend. Um, and then Jared Thank Leto you. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jared Leto is the man. So, um, spoiler alert, he's only really in two scenes, but his presence looms over this film. And I think that his performance can be uh, attributed to that for sure. So I honestly don't have any complaints performance-wise, in my opinion. Yeah, I actually completely agree with you. Uh, There's nothing to complain about with these performances. I thought everybody was kind of on their A game. Harrison Ford, maybe, but he's barely in this movie, and he's just playing Harrison Ford, so that's oh, yeah. fine. Like he's just doing that's all his he Harrison plays Ford. anymore, anyways. Yeah, so he's just doing his thing in this movie, and he's barely in it. So there's not a ton of complaints there. I will say that Jared Leto, for me, just didn't have that presence. He has a creepy vibe to him, but he's not very involved in this movie. Like he's prominent in the trailer, so it would lead you to believe like he has this huge role. And I guess in the in the scope of the movie, he does have a huge role. You just don't see him very often. And so I thought that was, I, I don't want to say that he was misused because I think that, uh, the whole movie is pretty good. So I, I think they definitely use his character well, but, um, I just didn't have the affinity for his character as, as you did. 
I will say that I'm uncomfortable that you call him Baby Goss. I don't like that at all. I don't call him Baby Goss. I call him Baby Goose. Baby Goose? Go- I don't know. Gosling is a baby goose. Oh, I, I don't know that. I'm not a zoologist. Well, I'm uncomfortable that you call Joseph Gordon-Levitt the hyphen, so I'm going to call him Baby Goose, and that's just going to be the way it is. I don't, I don't like it. I really don't like it. <laughs> Anyways, I actually think that he, and I may have said this before, I think he's one of the more overrated actors working today. I really just don't get a lot of people's Ooh. love for him. I think that... Words. Yeah, I know, right? I, I, I feel like I'm definitely in the minority there. Um, cause there's so many people that know a lot more about film than I do that say he's awesome. So I guess I, I'm just wrong on this particular t- topic, but I just feel like because he's in these movies where his character is supposed to be really deep and mysterious that everybody kind of gives him credit that isn't there. I think a lot of his characters are boring and void of emotion and everybody kind of gives him credit where it's not due. But, Judging by that low bar, because I don't think he's a very good actor, um, I think this is probably his best performance since Lars and the Real Girl, because I think he was actually really, really good in that movie, and I really liked him for a while, and then Drive really... What about the nice guys? Huh? What about the nice guys? I mean, he's okay in that movie, but he's not playing that mysterious character in that movie. Like, I think they, they do him... I like, I think that's kind of in his wheelhouse, the Ryan Reynolds kind of jokester bad boy in that movie. I think he plays that character really well, but I just don't think that he plays the dark and mysterious character very well. And everybody kind of gives him credit for it because he's in Drive and he's in these other weird movies that I think are super boring. Like, I didn't like Drive at all. I don't understand why people think that that movie is so good. But, uh, yeah, I just think that he's kind of overrated, but I really, really like his performance in this movie. Uh, kind of moving along, um, I thought Dave, Dave Batista was actually surprisingly good in this movie. Like, I'm starting to kind of warm up to him as an actor when he kind of is used properly. We've talked a lot about him in Guardians of the Galaxy, and I think that his character is used pretty well in that movie. And I'm kind of warming up to him as an actor because he's used sparingly. He's only really in one scene in this movie. And the scene's pretty awesome. I really enjoyed it. So I kind of have to give him credit where his credit's due. I think that he's becoming more of an actor and not just a wrestler that's kind of an actor. I think that yeah. he's a pretty decent when he's not asked to do too much. Uh, but I do agree with you that Anna de Armas uh, kind of steals the show for me. She brings so much emotion to this film, which is surprising because she's not a real person. So I think that she d- definitely brings her A game. And I really feel the connection between her and Kay, which is why I don't think that you cut that storyline off of, out of this movie because I think it brings so much emotion to the movie. Cool. All right, so moving right along, the next segment, and this is probably going to be pretty short. Um, we only kind of talk about it every so often, and that is the action. And I think that most of this movie is more of a detective story. Like I said, with the original Blade Runner, I was expecting kind of a sci-fi movie, and I got more of a detective story. And this movie, I was expecting that, and that's kind of what it is. So there's not a ton of action in this movie. I thought that the first opening fight scene between... K and David Batista's uh, character was really, really good. I thought it was a great way to kick off the film. I thought it was really, really cool. Uh, it's not over the top, but it's kind of what you expect with this movie because it's more of a detective story than an action film. And you don't really get a ton of action until really the end of the movie. And I really love the showdown between K and Love, I think is her name, in the movie. And I felt like it was just another really good callback, kind of the fighting in the water. And I felt like that was kind of a callback to the final scene in the original Blade Runner film. So I thought that was really cool. And it was just a really cool action scene to begin with. So I appreciate the the kind of subtle callbacks in the sequel to the original. And I thought the action, even though it's used sparingly in this movie, I thought it was really well done. You know that whenever Harrison Ford got the script and saw that he was going to be a part of that action scene you talked about and that he was going to be required to be submerged in water. He was probably a pretty pissed off old man. There's no way that he, en- he enjoyed that at all. And I'm surprised that he even did it because he seems like he's just a grumpy old man at this point. But uh no, I, I agree with you that there, 
the action is limited, but when there is action, I thought that it was really well done. But again, it's not really an action movie. It's a, it's a detective story. But one thing I do want to point out that kind of highlights the action is the cinematography. Uh, the cinematography in this movie is amazing. The visuals are stunning. And therefore, when there is action, it's just beautifully shot like the at- entire film is. So definitely a, a gorgeous movie to see. For sure. So are you ready to give it a star rating? I am. I am going to give it four stars. All right. <laughs> it always seems weird because it it's it's weird when we review these movies and we give them star ratings. It's like one of us is sometimes more negative than the other, but then we always end up giving it the same star rating. So I'm also really? giving it four, but I kind of went I, back in between four and four and a half because I really yeah, like this you movie talk- quite a lot. The way you talked about it, I really thought you were going to give it four and a half. I just, I don't know. I, I'm just a lot more cautious with my, I guess my, like I, I don't know. I, I think it's more important than it is. Like I'm like, oh man, like I gotta say four and a half and five for the really, really good movies. I mean, I, I really enjoyed this movie quite a lot, but not quite enough to give it a four and a half, obviously. I will say when I first got out of the movie Friday, I was leaning towards a three and a half, but the more I've gestated on it, uh, the more that I've really come to appreciate what I watch. So that's why I bumped it up to a four. All right, cool, man. So you're ready to give this uh, episode a bow? Yeah, so definitely want to end the episode with a nerd favorite like we always do. It's my week. So uh, obviously we are closed out on the first week of Shocktober at this point. So uh, in that respect, I do want to make this kind of horror movie related and last night i watched a movie for the first time and that is the original fright night from the 80s and after watching that i was just honestly curious what your favorite vampire movie is uh so for me i i there are a couple that i was kind of going back and forth between and that was uh from dust till dawn and obviously uh the remake of fright night that uh you and i have both gone on record as of loving quite a bit and i think that for all intents and purposes, I'm going to give the edge to the the Fright Night remake. And I know that that might be blasphemous, especially after just watching the original. But I think that the remake's actually a lot better. I think that the performances are great. Of course, Anton Yelkin's in it. And then Colin Firth is great as the vampire in that film. Um, and I believe, isn't Tony Collette play his mom in that movie? Um, which she's always, she's always fantastic. Uh, and then what I really like about that movie as well is it's kind of a throwback to 80s horror movies a little bit. It has a very suburban feel to it and a very neighborhoody uh, type horror movie, which is what I really appreciate. Uh, so for me, that it doesn't get much better than that when it comes to, to vampires. And it's a staple for me that I'll watch every year and I will watch at some point this year. Uh, the the original's definitely not bad, and it has some really cool effects for its time period. It reminded me of an American werewolf in London, but uh, at the end of the day, I got to give the edge to the remake. Yeah, I, I mean, I love the remake, and I, like you, had never seen the original until we watched the remake, and then I think for a Shocktober a couple of years ago, I finally got around to watching the original, and I don't know, maybe I'm just... Because I watched the the remake before I saw the original, I just kept comparing it to that, and it just it's weird because it's the original, and but it really doesn't live up to what I thought of the remake for sure. Like I think that's a far superior movie. Dust from Dust Till Dawn is a good choice, but I think that ultimately I'm gonna go with Blade Two which is okay. more of an action movie than it really is a vampire movie. But I just thought that the Blade franchise, I mean, Trinity is not good, so don't watch that. But the first two Blade movies are really, really good. And I like that it, it tried to bring a different mythology to the vampires. Like, it, it's definitely one of those movies that you, oh, you think you know what vampires are, but this is actually what they really are. And, of course, it's based on a comic book, a Marvel comic book, which I'm always going to be more of a fan of because I'm such a Marvel uh, fanboy. So, uh, Blade 2 is definitely the best Blade movie of the three by far. I just really like it. And of course, I love Guillermo del Toro. And I actually, it's, it's funny that you asked this question because I did go to Shocktober in Irvington and one of, uh, the guys that we've talked to a few times, Tony, uh, Trixel from, uh, Geeking in Indiana. We talked to him uh, when we go to 
Indy PopCon every year. He was actually sitting next to me, and I did not know this about him, but he used to live in L.A., and he used to work on movie sets, and he worked on Blade 2, and he was talking to me about oh, yeah. that while we were uh, about to watch Shocktober and Irvington. So it's just weird that you asked me that question uh, because I had this kind of – not really funny, but it was just kind of a coincidental story to go along with my answer. But yeah, Blade 2 is definitely it. I'm, I'm curious. I know this is kind of a little off topic, but uh, I was watching – I know that you love uh, werewolf movies, and I, I don't love them as much as you do, but I do enjoy the genre. I was looking for a good vampire – not a vampire uh, – werewolf movie the other day, and I was like, man, it's really hard to find a good one. Like, there's a yeah, lot of is. silly <laughs> ones, but it's really hard to find a good one. And I was thinking about it. I was like, why? Because it's a popular genre. And I realized that horror movies are usually done on a pretty small budget. And it's really tough to make a good werewolf look good oh, on a sure. small budget. So I think that's probably the reason that we don't have a lot of good werewolf movies. We get a lot of stupid ones because it's hard to make a good one on a small budget. Yeah, it's definitely easier to do something like add fangs to somebody's mouth and call them a vampire than it is to completely transform somebody into a werewolf or use CGI or, or whatever. Plus, you know, American Werewolf in London is pretty highly regarded and it's hard to come close to a movie like that. So I don't know that many people try. Yeah, and because that, that movie is a comedy, the transformation looks kind of silly but it's it works within the constructs of that movie because it's a comedy. So you're allowed to laugh at it. But when you have a serious horror movie that happens to have a werewolf and you have a transformation scene, which you have to because it's a werewolf movie and it doesn't look good and you're trying to go hardcore horror with it, it just it takes you out of the movie for sure. I think that's why so many, especially like recently, uh, so many movies or TV shows that want to incorporate a werewolf just have them like – Animorph into a wolf as opposed to them being some type of monster, which I think is definitely a cop out. Yeah, I uh, I eventually went with late phases. I'm not sure if that's a movie that you've seen. No, but uh, it was it was actually pretty good. Uh, the werewolves do eventually at the, towards the end, the third act, you do see a few werewolves and they do look pretty silly. But by then, I was kind of digging the movie, so I didn't really bother me that much. They definitely have a very small budget on this movie, and they, they I think, not not necessarily wasted it, but they I think they used about 75% of it on that transformation uh, scene. And it actually did look okay for a low-budget horror movie. I thought it looked pretty good. There was a – and I talked about it on the podcast. There was a movie last year that I watched that was really – a really good horror – horror movie that was a werewolf movie and i want to say it was howl where there are howl is very very good i like that yeah. uh, that movie quite a lot i had forgot about that movie i'll have to watch it this year for sure all right so that's it for episode 160 of the nerds you're looking for podcast as always we would appreciate if you subscribe rate review us on itunes stitcher radio basically any good podcatcher you use we're on it you can also check out our website the nerdspodcast.com you can comment and subscribe to our youtube channel Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. They're both at the Nerds Podcast. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Google Plus. And you can email us at the Nerds You're Looking For at gmail.com. And finally, vote for us for Podcast of the Month at podcastland.com. For Patrick Kuhn, Tyler Hunt. We are the Nerds You're Looking For. Take it easy, guys. Later, guys. Later, guys.